the opportunity is what matters to most of those people that come over. It's not a Fenway Park thing, it's not a New England thing, it's, it's an America thing. Particularly at this point in our, in our history of our country, where we are today, I think now is the time. But it's not us against them, there's only us. Good morning, folks. I've been asked to ask you to uh, take your seats so the program can start as soon as we can. It's a nice crowd here. And then folks are still coming in. How are we doing? We're good? Hello, everybody. Hello, Boston. And I would say, hello, the best of Boston. Is Boston in the house? Just out of curiosity, quick demographics. Is Dorchester in the house? Is Rosendale in the house? How about Mattapan? All right. Doesn't make any difference. One, one is still part of the family. How about Hyde Park? All right. Uh, here's a big East Boston. All right. How about Beacon Hill? Oh, a little quiet. <laughs> how, how about Back Bay? How about Mission Hill? Mission Hill's in the house. All right. Jamaica Plain, JP. JP, El Oriental de Cuba. West Roxbury, West Roxbury. Roxbury in the house, everybody. All right, everybody's here. Well, hello, my name is Jorge Quiroga. I'm a reporter at uh, Channel 5, WCVB. Been in Boston for a while, and I really want to thank you for taking time on a Saturday morning, right before Christmas, to come here and participate in what I think is such an important discussion, such an important dialogue, now as important as ever, if not more. Um, uh, we also want to welcome you, and first let's thank our hosts here at Northeastern University for allowing us this opportunity to be here at the Blackman Auditorium. Uh, as you know, we are here today for a com uh, discussion, a community discussion, and a chance to speak with the mayor, ask him some questions, hear what he has to say about the topic of racism. The fact that this is the second annual Boston Talks About Racism in and of itself tells you that this is something that this city and the folks in our family, because we are familia, we are a family. We want and we need to discuss. And I know sometimes it's framed in a black and white situation, but we all know it's not black and white. We all know that this goes beyond the African American. It also includes the Latinos, the Muslim immigrants coming in, Cape Verdeans, and many other groups. So it's important that we are aware of the changing dynamic. While we're looking to become a more socially cohesive and resilient city, we are still facing a great deal of racism in the workplace, in schools, and in our communities. Now this morning we will hear from a few of our leaders here in Boston about this very important topic. But before we do so, let's take a moment to reflect, and we will listen to the spoken words of Boston poet Pedro Cruz. Pedro?
How's everybody doing? Oh, no pressure, no pressure. All right. <clears throat> so I grew up in Boston. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican artist. Uh, I, I major in photography and poetry. And I'm going to drop two pieces today for you guys. And first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and having this discussion. We all know it's very important, especially in the times that we are in today. And I hope we um, start off um, the day good with these pieces. So the first one is called When I Was Blind. And um, growing up in the neighborhood, you know that, that before you, you, you come to the self-awareness and self-knowledge of who you are, you're considered blind. So this, is, um, this piece kind of covers the process of waking up. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? All right, let's do this. Back when I was blind, I didn't mind all the confusion. I was blind to the fact that I was living an illusion. During school, I focused in almost all my classes and believed almost everything I saw through my glasses. History class, my favorite, it became a memory game. Remember the date of the war, the name, and who was to blame. I would sleep with no worries and dreamed of being famous. Of course, that was before I even knew what fame is. I look forward to the future and used to plan all my days out. Now I just live for the moment and see how it all just plays out. Back when I was blind, I believed in our president. Called myself an American and even felt like a resident. I was proud of our military system because I grew up cold-hearted. Now I'm just shocked at all the wars we started. If you would have asked me back then, I would have said I'm Puerto Rican. As far as my native tongue, it was the Spanish I was speaking. But then I read a few books and began to realize that throughout my whole life I've been living real lies. My people were conquered by the Spaniards despite our bravery. 600 years later and we still living up slavery. The French did the same thing to the Haitians. So did England and Portugal with every other nation. We adopted their language, culture, and everything else with it. Now we so brainwashed we won't even admit it. The truth, I spit it. But they still don't see it because they ain't really looking. Meanwhile, I'm overwhelmed with the smell of what the government is cooking. It's really kind of obvious it doesn't take a scientist. It barely took a spark, just a spark of my interest. Back when I was blind, I did not respect the most high. Just chilled in ciphers trying to be the most high. I watched TV all day. No work, all play. It was yes for Bob and no way for Jose. But I'm grateful for the truth, which I learned little by little. Born dumb, but I'll die smart because I was found somewhere in the middle. So from here on, I'll bow down with my head towards earth and pray only to he who knew me before birth. Peace. Thank you, thank you. All right, where, where? I'm warmed up. All right, so this next piece, I'm apologizing ahead of time, but you guys are going to have to interact with me. Hopefully this wakes you guys up. And if it doesn't work out, it's your fault. It's all your fault because <laughs> you didn't interact with me. So anytime that I put my hand up like this, I want you guys to, to scream at me with a passion and ask me, where you from? So we're going to practice that real quick. Where you you, you you guys did this before? All right. Let's do that. Let's do this. I love you guys. I'm from where viejitos sit on the front porch in the morning eating pan con mantequilla, where chamaquitos pursue piragua carts, where mujeres weave the culture of the land into sombreros and sell them to the gringos. I'm from where abuela be like, mira muchacho, bájate de ahí, te vas a matar. And papi be like, pero deje ese nene quieto, déjalo que corre y brinque. But mommy be like, yo no te voy a llevar para el hospital, ya lo sabe. I'm from where if you don't finish your food, ha <laughs> y la chancleta que este se cree que estoy jugando. Where if you don't behave in public, you get that. Deja que lleguemos a casa. Where the youngest get away con lo que sea, and the oldest get the cocotazos. I'm from where you get smacked for misbehaving, and then you get smacked again for crying about it. Quiere llorar con gana. Where if you tell your mom, tengo hambre, but don't want to eat what she cooks, she hits you with the, but no tiene hambre. I'm from where you ask your papi for five dollars and he'd be like, Betty preguntar a tu mai. So then you ask mommy and she'd be like, Porque no le preguntas a tu pai. And then I'd be like, I did, and I asked, and then he told me, Dejate vete para allá jugar Nintendo. I'm from where I'm too Americanized to be Boricua, but I'm too Boricua to be American. Where we juggle two languages, being fácil on a daily basis. Where if someone doesn't understand English, we switch it up like, Hola, como esta? ¿Puedo ayudarte con algo? 
I'm from where it's okay to eat a plate of arroz con habichuel y pernil at 10 in the morning, where you can grab frutas off the arboles in the front of your casa, where it's normal to see someone riding down the carretera on a caballo. I'm from where if you listen closely, you can hear the Tainos llorando every time que el viento sopla, where abuela rises with the morning sun to make her favorite grand grandchild some sopa, where you know you're in for it when you dirty your brand new ropa. I'm from where the sangre of my ancestor fertilizes the soil we use to sembrar our seeds of hope, where la historia de nuestra patria is all we have left to fight for, where the government who maldito pillo. I'm from where we speak the language of our slave masters but call it our own, where if you're blanquito, boricua con ojos claro, you think you're better than that trigueñito con pelo malo, where white Spaniards raped and abused those who came before me to the point that I can close my eyes and feel their pain. I'm from where every plate of food comes con arroz y habichuela, where it's not seasoned right unless there's some adobo y sazón, where the elders like to bo child like it's a sport. Tú puedes creer que el hijo de Blanca tiene una amiguita. I'm from where an island in the middle of the ocean, a big ocean surrounded by water, where we pray to La Virgen Maria as Hurricane Maria did a number on us, where a gallon of leche costs more than a gallon of gasolina. I'm from where anyone who lives outside the island is considered de afuera, where hombrecitos learn to um, gut pigs before reaching cuarto año, where residents go to sleep to the sound of coquis and gunshots. I'm from Puerto Rock. Thank you guys, I appreciate it, man, that was fun. Call that Boston talent. <laughs> I recognized a lot of those lines myself. <laughs> you got hurt. Bah! Anyway, I'm moving on. Thank you, Pedro. That was terrific. Now I want to uh, welcome and I, for you folks to give a really warm round of applause to our host, a man who is as impressive, if not more impressive in person than he is on his resume, the president of Northeastern University who helped make this possible, Joseph Aoun. I'll move it, I'll move it. Good morning, good morning everyone. Good morning, I'll be brief, which is difficult for a university president. So my job here is to welcome you uh, to Northeastern and also to talk about what is happening here with us. But let me start with a personal note. I'm an immigrant. I came to this country some years ago, and I came to Boston. And Boston, for me, has been my first home. I left Boston, went to Los Angeles, and came back 24, year, 24 years later, and Boston welcomed me. So I want to tell you, being an immigrant in Boston beats being an immigrant in any other city in the United States. And I mean it. When I work with the mayor, the first thing he is stressing constantly with me is we have to provide opportunities. And we have to provide opportunities because that's the only way the city can move forward. And those opportunities have a range. We're talking about opportunities in education and working with him. I am happy to say that every year we have 400, over, close to 500 students, 480 students from the Boston Public Schools who are here with us, on fully supported by grants, by financial aid given to them, and this is work that has been going on for some years, thanks to uh, the mayor. We are providing opportunities also, not only in terms of education, but in terms also of wellness. You know, we're working on the Carter Playground. We're working with health, uh, health centers. We're providing opportunities also in terms of businesses, providing businesses to minorities in our neighborhood to the tune of $65 million. We're providing opportunities in terms of culture, in terms of our roots, not to forget our roots. We, because of the work with the community, we launched the uh, Lower 
Roxbury Black History Project, and I invite you to go visit uh, the, the work that's being done in its uh, here on campus. You can go uh, to the library. It's the oral history of uh, uh, Lower Roxbury and the black community. So if I provide this picture, it's to tell you that a lot is being done, and we're not the only institution doing it, but we may be the institution that's doing the most. But beyond that, there is a lot to do. There is a lot to do because on a daily basis, I see students here who are afraid to say who they are. We have DACA students who are afraid to say who they are, and that's unacceptable. You know, once again, and I, you know, they tell me when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, they say, I'd rather be here than any other city in the United States. Let's not forget that. There is a lot to be done at all levels providing opportunities, in the dialogue about race, in uh, welcoming immigrants. When I talk to uh, members of the Muslim community, they are going through a rough time. It's very difficult to be Muslim. And once again, they say, I'd rather be here than in any other city. Are we perfect? Not. No, we are not. But we are doing a lot. This city is doing a lot. And I think we have a leader, the mayor, who is really charting a path for all of, all of us, a vision of unity, but also a vision of work. So welcome to Northeastern one more time, and I'm looking forward to being part of this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, he doesn't need the, the little stool, the little riser here. Otherwise, it'd be like, hello. No problem being five foot six. Anyway, before uh, I introduce the, uh, our next speaker, I looked up the definition today just to make sure that I knew exactly what it meant. The word resilience It's part of why we're here today. Just straight definition, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. Let me introduce first, in 2015, Dr. Atiyah Martin became the city's first chief of resilience, the first chief resilience officer. Under the leadership of the Walsh administration, Dr. Martin's office is engaged with advancing racial equity and strengthening our collective resilience to thrive when confronting issues of racism that persist in our communities. Please, everyone welcome Dr. Atiyah Martin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You all look amazing. I am so happy to see these beautiful faces sitting out here in the audience. I don't have a lot of time, and I won't go into a lot of details on a lot of things, but what I wanted to do is give us an overview of what today, the rest of today is going to look like, connect it back to the resilient strategy, and then give you a brief overview of the sessions, the breakout sessions that we're gonna have so you can be thinking about where you would like to go for today. That sound good? All right. So first I wanna thank all of the folks who have been on this journey with us from the beginning, from since when I started. And so thank you to the Boston Resilience Collaborative. Thank you to all of our supporters who've come out to all the events we've helped to coordinate and facilitate over the last few years. And thank you to all of you for being here with us today. It is an honor and a pleasure to have had this opportunity to serve in the role of Chief Resilience Officer. And when we think about the relationship of resilience to the policies and practices and our own roles as individuals and organizations, the idea here is that we take responsibility. We take responsibility for the fact that we're part of building resilience in this city, but also the actions that we take can also detract from that resilience. That also means we take responsibility for how we confront racism, not just outside of ourselves, but inside of ourselves. Because we are all struggling with these issues, whether we're a person of color or whether we're white. 
And that's part of this journey, that's part of the opportunity, and that's part of the hard work that we all have to do. So with that said, for those who have not seen the resilience strategy, you can find it at boston.gov forward slash resilience. And for today, we are going to have a, <clears throat> a wonderful video that talks a bit about what's happening in City Hall, some things that were started long before I came along, some things that were started as a result of the connections of the resilient strategy and the work that's happening in some of our city departments. And in terms of the rest of the day, we're gonna have Mayor Walsh come up with support from our wonderful facilitator, uh, Orhei Kiroga, and they're going to take your questions and we're gonna have a conversation and then we're gonna break out into our breakout sessions. So I just wanna bring this up to show you where we're at. So we're gonna to transition to breakouts. We're a little bit behind, so those times will shift a little bit. So we are going to transition into our breakout groups just a little bit later after we finish with the question and answer session. Then when we finish with our breakout groups, we're gonna come back together and instead of doing the normal report outs where we sit and listen to everyone talk about all the different things we discussed, we're actually going to do it in a more informal way that allows us to have a deeper conversation about what happened in our different groups. We will be kicked off with uh, lunch to wrap us up and we are going to have the Chittick Chorus Choir come and finish us off for the day. So we are gonna have little people wrapping us up today with their beautiful voices, as it should be. So all that said, when we think about what the sessions are, so I want you to um, be thinking about this as you sit in the audience. So these are the breakout sessions for today. So we have a session that focuses on dialogue to action. This is the work in partnership with the Himes Foundation that is really about building the skills of a core group of facilitators to train them up on how to lead discussions around racism so that we can go even deeper in communities and look at how this is impacting all of us and what we can do about it. So it's leveraging dialogue for us to be able to get to the action, but we have to start with the dialogue piece first. And so that, that will be in Richard's 200, um, and I'll bring this back up later, but I want you to focus on the topic so that you can be thinking about where you wanna go. So we actually have some facilitators with us here today who've gone through that training that you can talk to and ask questions and give feedback to. The other group is Boston's immigrant community, and this is about exploring the realities of what's happening at the national level with immigration policies and what we can be doing here at the local level. And really, again, this is another exploratory session that really is about setting the framing of the information, but also getting your feedback. The next session is about the Office of Returning Citizens and looking at how that office led under Kevin Sibley will be working with people who were formerly incarcerated, reintegrating back into our communities, economic inclusion and looking at what, are, what can we do to push forward towards that equitable economic opportunity uh, vision area within the resilient strategy and how do we address issues of the wealth gap. And then the last but certainly not least is walk, talk and learn session. And this one will be where we talk a lot about several different initiatives that we have that are moving forward they are funded, and there's also some resources available to uh, the community and many of you to learn more about that can support ideas and work that you would like to do in the community and resources that will uh, fund that work. So all that said, this is what you should be thinking about as, you, as we go through the rest of the program so you can know what you would like to do at the end, and we'll have some, we'll, I'll give you some more instructions a little bit later. All that said, I'm gonna come back. So all that said, what we would like to do next is to show you an amazing video that highlights the work that's happening in City Hall around advancing racial equity as a baseline. And please know that there's more happening and please know that there will be more happening in the future. Thank you so much for the opportunity to see you all again today. Thank you for the folks who this is their first time coming to one of our events. And we are gonna have an amazing morning. Thank you.
Days like today are very important. We need to have more opportunities to talk openly and honestly about race. This is not where my story begins, nor where it ends. We will be back one year from now to talk about the progress we made. This is not the end. This is the beginning. Thank you very much. We started something new in Boston with our dialogues on race. It's more than a conversation. It's a commitment to keeping equity at the top of the agenda in everything that we do. To me, an equitable Boston is a city where everyone can get what they need to thrive. But we don't all start from the same place. We have a history with racism in our country and our city. Its impacts are deeply rooted. So these can be hard conversations, but they are necessary conversations. We have challenged ahead of us as a city in the 21st century. Climate change, inequality, problems in Washington. We have to be united and we have to break down the barriers that divide us. We have to draw on all of our talent and strength. Our future depends on it and our values demand it. That's why we put a racial equity at the heart of our resiliency plan. And that's why we focus on equity in everything we do. We founded Boston's first office of diversity to achieve greater equity in the city's workforce. We worked to make sure the hiring process is more accessible to communities of color. We foster career development to make sure workers of color can move up into decision-making positions. And we've increased transparency, the diversity dashboard you can explore online. We also report on our progress. For example, new data shows that last year, 54% of the city's new hires were people of color. That's a first for the city of Boston. And we helped launch four new employee resource groups, including for workers of color. We focus on equity in our culture as well as in our data. We founded Boston's first Office of Workforce Development with the mission of achieving greater equity in Boston's workforce. We've moved thousands of workers of color from low-wage jobs into career pathways with living wages. We've launched the tuition-free community college program for high school graduates from low-income families. And in the past year, we have begun building pipelines from Boston high schools into good jobs at city agencies. We are focused like a laser beam on equity. We have refocused Boston's economic policy around an equity and inclusion agenda. We created Boston's first citywide small business plan with a goal of increasing racial and geographic equity. For the first time, that work is supporting co-ops and employee ownership models that keep more wealth in the community. We strengthen the Boston resident jobs policy so more local workers of color are sharing in our construction boom. We're also working to get businesses owned by people of color more access to city contracts. In the past year, we have begun reviewing proposals for a disparity study that, once complete, will allow us to make more decisive progress toward equity. And so as we pitch to these new companies, we want to make sure that the company knows what we stand for and also how we can benefit from what they stand for. It's a great opportunity to really link our values together, and I think at the, at the heart of that is how we can create more equity and more inclusion for our students, for people across all neighborhoods in Boston and really provide more access points for people to feel plugged in to the workforce development opportunities that many of these companies can provide uh, within the Boston community. Equity is at the core of our education strategy. We talk less now about achievement gaps and more about opportunity gaps. We know that if outcomes are diverging, that means opportunities are missing. Our work is focused on closing those gaps, whether in access to information, in curriculum, in facilities, or in resources at home and in the neighborhood. In Boston Public Schools, we are focused on equity in everything we do. We are closing the opportunity gap in pre-kindergarten. We're bringing rigorous curriculum and STEM skills, not to some schools, but all schools. And in the last year, we have strengthened our national leadership in hiring teachers and leaders of color. 60% of our new principals we hired are black. And for the first time in history, all three exam schools are led by people of color. We fund grassroots organizations throughout the city that directly develop young people of color in their skills, networks, and overall capacity. In order for our young boys and men of color to really have a true chance in this great city, equity has to be our focus and overall mission. In the last year, we've collected a new round of data from the 225 employers that are part of the Women's Workforce Council. 
In this new report, not only did we pay attention to the wage gap by gender, but also by race, because we know that the barriers for women of color are even greater than white women. In the Environment Department, we're focused on equity. It's something that we think is incredibly important in the work that we do as we prepare the city of Boston to deal with the impacts of climate change. We recognize, as we've done a vulnerability assessment, that some of the most impacted communities will be those that have the least means to respond to those issues. And that means that as we do that planning, as we take those actions, as we educate our residents and our businesses, we have to make sure that we come up with the strategies that will ensure that everyone in the city of Boston will be prepared to deal with the impacts of climate change. We are focused on digital equity because high-speed internet access is essential for full inclusion in our economy. In the last year, we have supported organizations like Tech Goes Home and the Boston Neighborhood Network. We launched the Digital Equity Fund to expand this work, and we're really excited to be part of the Youth Lead the Change participatory budgeting process. Under their direction, we are deploying wicked free Wi-Fi in several Boston centers for youth and families. We focus on equity and civic engagement by making sure that every neighborhood's needs are heard and in every neighborhood gets access to city service that meets their unique needs. We are focused on equity in public works. We know that the built environment too often reflects and perpetuates racial disparities. We have to be intentional about changing that. For example, in the last year, we have begun changing the way we schedule sidewalk repairs. The system was driven by constituent requests. When we looked at that more closely, we saw neighborhoods with more resources were making more requests and getting more service. We realized we have to be proactive and make the repairs where they are needed the most. In many cases, that's in neighborhoods of color. And now, that's what we're doing. In Boston, we truly are a community policing agency. We focus on equity and police work more than ever before. We understand the people of Boston. We understand the communities we serve and the challenges they are facing. In the last year, we've reduced arrests while increasing our outreach and relationships. We continue to focus on building trust and building equity. Our office was launched this year to help people returning to Boston after incarceration. This is an equity issue, especially for communities of color. We're hoping to meet that collective need by making sure individuals get a real second chance a real second chance to contribute to their community. What we're really doing is giving Bostonians a sense of ownership in our city and helping them build wealth and making our community stronger together. Last year, we launched the Neighborhood Homes Initiative using 250 city-owned lots to build affordable homes for first-time home buyers. And this year, we increased the down payment and closing cost pool to help more people buy a home and build their dreams. We increase equity in planning by making sure discussions about the future of our neighborhoods are accessible for everyone, no matter race, gender, age, or language. The past year, we have been listening to communities talk about their history, their hopes and fears, and their questions about the future. Our goal is to grow together as a city in all our diversity. One of the key themes of Imagine Boston 2030 is a focus on equity. We want to increase access to opportunity and reduce the disparities we see around our city. To do that, we have to put together a very collaborative process that includes community organizations, our, all of our community members. Your voices really need to be what helps us implement this plan. We are focused on equity because persistent racial inequality not only undermines our collective ability to withstand shocks, it is by itself a slow-moving catastrophe in too many of our communities. Our response must be a healing journey with intentional action towards a more equitable and more resilient Boston. The drive for equity just doesn't live in my office. It's in every department, every program, every service. It's in the data we track, but fundamentally it's in the people and relationships. You have to know someone to know what they're facing. So it's policies and practices, and it's hearts and minds. It has to be both. I know we have a long way to go as a country and as a city. Sometimes with all that's going on, it feels like one step forward and two steps back. But we are committed to growing in our equity and our unity as a city. Martin Luther King Jr. said it, and President Obama quoted him many times. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And it's why I call on all of us to keep this dialogue going today and every day.
We saw him on the screen. <laughs> you see him at parades, waving. Every once in a while, you, uh, you'll see him on television. From the big screen to the stage, let's welcome the mayor of the city of Boston, Marty Walsh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, before we, before we uh, get into the conversation, and remember, this is really a Q&A. We're going to have about uh, 45 minutes uh, for members of the audience to ask uh, the mayor uh, whatever kind of question you have on your mind relating to racism, uh, what we can do, what the city is doing, what he's doing to, to face this really it is, the, to me, the, the, the topic, the issue of our time. Now, we obviously are hoping to engage uh, as many people as possible. So, this is what I usually tell folks when I go to do an interview and they have a problem. If you can't explain it to me in 10 minutes, I can't put it into a minute 15. So this is a Q&A question and answer. So let's refrain from uh, speeches. This is not a time for speeches. This is a time for questions. And again, we're talking about a, a subject that goes beyond black and white, that goes beyond brown and white. These days, uh, it, it, we're talking about Muslims coming in and having issues, Latinos coming here and having issues. This is about a persistent problem, but it's a problem that the city, as you can see, is addressing. So what we're going to have is eight ushers, I believe, in the audience. And when you have a question, you will raise your hand, like we did in classrooms. I used to teach up the hill at Mission Hill. And uh, the usher will come over, and uh, I will be, do my best going maybe left to right, right to left, to get as many people as possible. Now, we have 45 minutes. I'm going to keep an eye on the clock. Somebody here is supposed to uh, keep me a track. There, I've got it in front. Uh, I'll give you a, an idea when we have 10 minutes left. So if you, uh, again, you want to ask a question, stay seated, raise your hand, and I'll call on you. So I'm sure uh, everybody wants to get going. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, obviously this week uh, the Boston Globe did a big takeout yeah. on racism in, in, in the city. You can take issues with many of specific points yeah. that were made. But I think that the, the big picture is the issue of perception versus reality. Uh, I personally, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the first question, if you, if you don't mind. And I've worked in Boston long enough to know that I've seen, from my experience here for some 45 years, the worst of Boston during uh, busing, yeah. and then maybe the best of Boston after the Boston Marathon when we all came together. Yeah. Again, the issue beyond black and white, the administration is certainly doing a lot. You're putting your money where your mouth is about diversifying, bringing more people around the table in the conversation and the decision making. Yet, not everybody works for the city or wants to work for the city. Really? <laughs> Still, it's the, for the private sector yep. that, you know, that, uh, that is the, the big player in this conversation. Is there a, an unwillingness or an inability to change? Is it a fact that they sometimes say, you know, we can't find the talent? I think it's a, a bit of everything. Um, I think it, it really depends on the individual leaders in companies and in society. Um, I think it, you know, what the Globe, what the Globe story did this week, uh, whether people liked it or didn't like it, it sparked conversation. Um, and that conversation is important to have to really get to how do we move forward. Now, let me just back up real quickly here, and I won't take too much time here, but. In 2013, when I was running for mayor, I said this last time I was, we, did it, we, did it, we did this uh, conversation. Um, I was asked by a woman in the audience what I thought the state of race and racism in Boston was. And, and I was a candidate for mayor, and I kind of danced on the issue, and I kind of jumped around it. And I said, you know, I, I represent the most diverse district of the state house, and I have 57% people of color, and, you know, and I'm, I have a lot of friends. And, and I just didn't do a good job. And she pushed me further. And after that, we went back in the policy, and we started talking about uh, is race and racism a topic for the mayor's race? And we, we made it a topic in the mayor's race. Other people did as well. But we talked about what we were going to do. We were going to have dialogues. And we were going to make, make it at the forefront. So as you talked about housing, and you talked about economic development, and you talked about education, and you talked about all those things, um, 
we, talk, we said race is going to be a piece of that. And then as we started to look at it more, race is actually tied into everything else we talk about. So I think when you, when, when you talk about equity and you talk about interest, I mean, we have talent in Boston. There's no question. I'm looking out at this audience now. We have a ton of young people of color in this audience uh, that have a ton of talent. So th that's not the issue. I think the issue is, is, is not understanding that, that we still have a lot of problems that we have to deal with as a society, not just in Boston, but in the United States of America. This is the United States issue, but I can't, we can't figure, fix the United States. We have to bring this conversation. I think we can't be afraid to have the conversation about race and racism. I think we have to, we have to not be afraid to say and, and, and acknowledge the fact that we have racism in our city and that we have racist uh, acts in our city and that we have to confront those. We can't be afraid to say that because you can't get better if you don't acknowledge the fact that there's a problem. Okay, good start. This is obviously a self-selected audience, people who are interested in the issue, people who have experienced it. So first question, I see a couple hands over here. How about this gentleman right there? Stan. Hi. I'm Stanley Pollock. I'm the director of the Center for Teen Empowerment. And uh, I was real pleased to see a couple of our young people from last year's speaking. Uh, and my question is, um, how, uh, what specific steps are you going to take to use the resource of teenagers, not only in terms of receiving services, but in positions of leadership, particularly around the issue of race? Uh, they are both the present and the future. And I think they can play a very powerful role. And a lot of the dysfunctional things that take place take place in that age category, particularly around race. No, th thank you for the conversation. I mean, the, the, the question, and Stan, we've worked together on a bunch of things, and I think you know that, that we, uh, I'm committed, and the administration is going to be committed to making sure that the young people have conversations. Um, the, the next step after today, uh, not next step, but what we've been planning on is, is having the, the racial dialogues around the city of Boston. And we, we've been working with facilitators, and the conversations need to include young people in these conversations. And I, I, think, I think when you think about it, I mean, what's happened in this conversation, I think, in the, last, in the last 12 months, quite honestly, it's gone from talking about race and racism to talking about society. And, and talking about we, we, the introduction, uh, Jorge talked a little bit about, or, or President Ayun talked about immigrants and Muslims. And so this conversation we started out was talking about racism in Boston, and we've gone to a whole new spectrum as far as, as, far, as, far as tolerance and what's happening in the country. So I think that when we have these dialogues, young people have to be part of the conversation. I, I think these dialogues have to get to the root of the issue of people acknowledging the fact that, it, it, that there is an issue and that we do have issues, and how do you fix those issues? I look around this room today, and I'm grateful for all of you to come today. Thank you for being here. Uh, but we should be able to fill five of these auditoriums to tr on this conversation, and people need to be part of these conversations because you can't just sit home and say, you know, and, and tweet out or, or, or make your feelings be heard. Come to these conversations because these are important dialogues to have. Young people need to be at the core of that. Um, I don't have a specific issue, I don't have specifics for you now, but everything that we do, whether it's the Youth Council, the Mayor's Youth Council, Teen Empowerment, where you have the police community dialogues that the police have, the firefighters started dialogues with their young people, the firefighters class, same thing about, about understanding what's happening at the fire department. We, we have these conversations going on in many of our schools. There are some principals here today. They're having dialogues in their schools. What happened at Latin School last year, two years ago, uh, there was a, a, a tremendous dialogue around that, around that, what happened there. Not just what happened in the school and it was being worked on, as administration, but really what happened was the young people took that whole movement on and they continued the dialogue and conversation. That's what has to happen. Yeah, and and that, in fact, it was, that's uh, exactly the resource that I hope we can really develop that not only has the young people engaged, but as part of the leadership. Well, I mean, I know you know, does you, you know they are, Stan, yeah. I mean, you know that. So I think that, you know, the way to do it is we, we talk. I mean, when we, as these dialogues have gone on, we need you to be at the table working with us. You know that. I mean, anytime you call, we're there. Great. Thank you very much. All right, we have a young lady right here in the front, please, in the blue sweater. And I'm, let me ask the facilitators, just let's, to, to keep it moving, why don't you identify a couple of other people who you know, have a question, and then we can move uh, quickly, all right? Your question. My name is Avian Bridgemohan. I live in Mattapan. Um, I want to ask the mayor, why is the city of Boston balancing the BPS transportation deficit on the backs of single black mothers and four-year-olds? 
Thank you for the question, although I, I know I appreciate that question. Uh, this isn't the exact form for that, but we'll talk about it. There's no balancing on the backs of four-year-olds. I think if, if you had a chance to go and look at what we're doing, actually, in a lot of neighborhoods, we're moving, we're allowing start times to be changed. So we get high school kids starting later, which studies show that they work. And we've shifted around because we can't have the cost is out of control. We're actually going to save money in this, in this move that, we, that we're proposing. And the money that we're going to have is going to be reinvested back in the school to be reinvested back in the school so that, so that we can look in schools to make sure that we have proper nurses and proper counseling and proper services for our young people. That's what this is all about. This is not about, this is not about four, everyone talks about four-year-olds. It's not about the four-year-olds and it's not about inconveniencing parents. It's about, it's about making sure we have better equity in our schools. And, and I think that families in Roxbury, George, and Mattapan for years have not, they have not gotten the attention, the schools have not gotten the attention that they deserve. And what we want to do finally is make the, make the adjustments so those schools get looked at so we have the same type of school across the city of Boston, more level one and level two schools. That's the goal here. Thank you. Once again, unfiltered questions. You know, it's an unbelievable opportunity, Mr. Mayor, and we really appreciate it. I saw this young man up here when the blue, uh, you had a question. And before he, before he asks, let me just look around. Raise hands now. People have questions, so I have an idea where to go. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Christopher Huang. Uh, I'd like to offer some constructive criticism while I have the opportunity to um, try to get Dan Coe to share this message with you. Uh, I'm not sure if he did. But um, so back in May with Adam Jones. We're not, we're not having speeches. We're having questions. What, what is your question, sir? So back in, um, back in May with Adam Jones, you said the words, uh, in response to it, you said, this is not who we are as a city. And I think this is really, these are really good intentioned words, but um, the impact of it is very dismissive. Um, I think the word should be... Should that's, be that's your opinion. Okay, that's fair. It is, it is my opinion, but I I've saw it as up there with uh, dismissive words such as, I don't see color, um, and you know, I, I don't, I'm not, I, I think the word should be in there. Um, I'm okay. here as a, yeah, I'm a photographer, I've been, um, I work across many industries and I'm here to say it, racism is an uh, issue of space and it's an issue of um, racism and sexism are still prominent in every single industry in Boston. Th th thank you. L let me take that as a question, just for a minute, because I, I want to address what you said. Um, in 2013, as I mentioned, we... Uh, I was in a forum that people talked to me, a woman particularly, a black woman talked to me about questioning me on racism. And the answer I gave wasn't what I was happy with, certainly she wasn't happy with it. It made me go back and look at um, situations on how we better talk about race, but actually dive in and, and work on race and racism. Um, Ferguson happened, um, under my meaning, when I became mayor, Ferguson happened. We had other incidents before that with police involved shootings, but I wasn't the mayor. Um, Baltimore happened, New York happened, all across the United States of America we had different types of shootings. And some of uh, my responses that were well-intentioned and, and as I responded, some people in my administration, particularly men of color in my administration, um, weren't afraid to come to me and said, you handled that wrong. And what you said, the words you used weren't, weren't exactly right. So what, what I did in response to that is I, brought, I asked a lot of folks, and some are here today, uh, I don't know if Conan's here, Conan Harris and, and Will Morales and a few other folks. And I asked them to come in and we t sat down and talked about being a person of color, a man of color, and the challenges that they had growing up. John Barros was part of that conversation. And it's about learning and evolving and admitting that you made a mistake. And it's about, as, as a person, you know, I may, should I have used the word should have? Uh, maybe, I don't know. But, but the point is, is that the conversation, the dialogues are about an understanding. So that when somebody responds to a question or a quote or a comment, that you're sensitive to the feelings of that person and that individual. You know, this, this conversation here today, you can ask, everyone can ask me all the questions they want about my specific incidents or if I, you know, start times or what have you. But what we're talking about here is having a dialogue. This isn't about Marty Walsh's opinion on stuff. This is about having the city have a dialogue on race and racism, and finally addressing the issue of race and racism. And it's not about my own personal feelings on it. This conversation should be happening regardless who's up here. Linda Forey's here. If Linda's up here, the conversation isn't the fact that Linda's a Haitian woman. The, the conversation's about race. 
If Russell Holmes, who's a Susie as state representative, he's sitting in this chair, it's not the fact that he's African American that he's in this chair, it's the fact that we're having a conversation on race. Eddie Flynn's in the back, I see him, a new state city councilor. If Eddie Flynn's in, that's what these dialogues are about. So for me, it's about learning. I'm not perfect, and there's no one in this auditorium that's perfect. But what we have to do is understand on how do we work to deal with the issue so that when a black man or a black woman or a Latino woman or a Latino man is walking down the street, they don't feel they're being looked at. When a person walks into a store to buy a, a shirt or a pair of pants, that they're not being followed around because I'm not because when I walk in the store, I don't get followed around. When you get pulled over because you're speeding down the road, you don't have to put your wallet on the dashboard and your hands on the wheel and look straight ahead because that was explained to me. That's what these conversations are really about. So thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Sure. Just on, oh yeah, hello. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for this dialogue, and thank you, Mayor Walsh, for your continued leadership and commitment around this very, very difficult subject. My name is Sarah Ting. I have lived my entire adult life here in Boston. I am the founder of World Unit Inc. And my question to you is this. As we all acknowledge, we have to include the young people. Yes. And we all know that prejudice and bias is not born in anybody. It's all learned behavior. My question is, we have a beautiful song that was performed at the United Nations by children. It's called We All See the Stars. We have a campaign right now called Singing Equality Across America. Would the mayor's office consider having the song be taught to all the children in Boston because it's being taught. We actually have a video of 429 children singing the song and they're even doing it in sign language. So that's my question to you, Mayor Walsh. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm sure somebody from the school department is here. So I want you to just make sure we get, talk to the press, talk to the school department so we can talk about how we do that in our school. Um, There's some questions up there. I did it. I had some questions in back. I'm getting in everyone. In. She has a microphone. She's got the microphone. Yep. Hi, my name is Taylor Key, and I'm just curious. If we're talking about racism, why are we not talking about it in the communities where it's most present? Why aren't we in the communities that are struggling? I understand people can come here, but you mentioned being sensitive. So if we know that younger people aren't as informed, why are, not we, why are we not being sensitive to the fact that they're not as informed and going to them where the problem is actually happening? Um, that's a good question. I think we pick a place like this because it's centrally located. And I think the fact that I don't think the conversation about racism necessarily has to happen in, I'm assuming you mean Roxbury, Dodge, Samantha, Pan. Well, yes, like in the communities where it's happening, the, some people yeah. don't really know that there's even... No, I, I get that. I get that. I, I don't think necessarily the conversations on racism have to happen in Dudley. I think the conversation on racism happen, happen in other neighborhoods in the city of Boston. When, when you look at uh, what we talked about in the video, or if you, if you talked about what was in, written in the Globe, um, opportunities missed that boards of corporations in Boston and Massachusetts and America are predominantly white. Uh, people, uh, people that are working in high-end jobs are predominantly white. I think the conversations on race has to be understood across the board. This young man brought up a, a point of, of my comments on Adam Jones, and, and then I talked to you about something I learned. I think racism has to be, un I think all, all people have to understand what racism is. I don't think people understand. I think most black people and most people of color in Boston when I say most, maybe all, I don't want to speak for all, understand what racism is. But I don't think other people outside of that understand what racism is. And the conversation on race has to be outside of, outside of, of black and, and people of color. You can't have it. Just, that doesn't solve an issue. That doesn't allow people to have the dialogue. And I think that that's, that's what is important. Uh, Stanley talked about young people. Um, I think it's important for young black men and young black girls to talk to people, white people, and explain what it, what it means to grow up as a young black man and a young black girl in, in an urban, in, urban city and, and what, they, what the challenges they might have compared to the young white people that are in your program. It's a completely different. So I think that's why. This isn't about, you want me to, we'll move it to Roxbury. We'll have, we can have a thousand people there. It's about the dialogue. It's a dialogue. That's what this is about. It's about a dialogue. So, and I can feel that, I can just feel the questions as they're coming. They're, they're, they're coming a little, with a little, little bit of a, it seems like an edge to them. 
This is about a dialogue. This is about, about taking this edge that I have and, and we all have in this room and taking it out across the city of Boston and, and having the courage to have the dialogue and conversation in the corner store, whether, whether, it's, in, whether it's whatever part of the city it's in, whether it's Jamaica Plain or Rosendale or West Roxbury or South Boston or Charlestown. That's what we have to do. Take, take this edge out there a little bit and talk about let's get people in the conversation. Okay, so I understand. So basically, so basically, I think I had a misunderstanding. I thought this was to actually create a change. But this is to talk about the issue. No, no, no. This is, this is a second conversation. What happens now, and Dr. Martin's going to talk about it later on, we break out the sessions. We have, I think the facilitators are here today. So the facilitators are going to begin now the dialogues in the neighborhoods of, of Boston. So it's not going to be, you're not going to have a thousand people. Some of these conversations might be 20 people, might be 30 people, could be 50 people, could be three people. And, and that's what's going to happen now after today, taking these conversations into the communities. So it's like the game where you tell a message and it gets passed along, and by the time it gets to the end, it's a completely different message? I don't understand what you just said. So what I'm saying is, so you're going to have people go and relay the message in the communities? No, not relay a message. Have a dialogue. Okay, so why can't we just have the dialogue in the community? We're going to. Anyway? There will be. There will be dialogues in the community. Okay. There absolutely will be. There will be, dialogue, hopefully, dialogues in every community. This young lady right here in the white shirt behind the third row. Folks in the back, I'm having a little difficulty uh, seeing the hands up, so maybe you'll stand and I, it'll be easier. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Ariana Constant Patton, Patton, and I work for Teen Empowerment. My question is, um, why do you believe that youth in the whole Boston community and majority of the United States seem to not really care about the issues on racism and not to really address it. Like, because a lot of youth from Teen Empowerment are here today, but why do you think a lot of youth outside of organizations like this don't care and aren't really hearing I, it? I don't think that. Um, I don't think that at all. I think that it's important that young people are part of a dialogue and a conversation. Uh, and I don't believe that they, they shouldn't be part of it. I don't believe they don't want to be part of it. I think that I can't control what happens in outside of Boston, what I mean by that is on, on conversations. Um, I think young people need to be part of those dialogues. Tina Parman's been part of these dialogues long before I was the mayor of Boston um, and having conversations on race and community relations and police relations and all of that stuff. Uh, I think young people have to be part of it. But ultimately, to, to pick up on your point, I think there really can be no change if the conversation is among a self-selected group like no. here. You have to have the people who are reticent yeah. to change, who are the gripers. And this wasn't a self-selected group. This is a group that decided to, to, to come here. But I do, I, I agree I with mean, you. By self-select, I mean they're interested oh, yeah, and they're interested in the dialogue. Yeah, we have to have, I mean, we have to have people, they used to say at the, at the coffee pot or the bubbler, the water, water bubbler, the, 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 the office talk. We need to have, those folks have the conversation. Um, you know, I'm going to say something right now. It's probably going to get me in, in a little heat with some people. But um, the dialogue, and quite honestly, many people in this room, you don't even have to be part of the dialogue. It's the people that aren't here we have to get part of the dialogue. That's what I mean. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, you know, what we talked about in the video, we talked about equity. Everything we're doing equity, whether it's economic development, whether it's contracts for people, whether it's education, whether it's water and sewer, whatever it is, we talk about equity. That same dialogue's not happening in corporate America. That same conversation, equity, is not happening. They might have a chief diversity officer in corporate America in their company, but it, it's, not getting, it's not getting enough. We're not, we don't have enough pathways in, in, from the private sector and from, from, from everyone else to help us get young people into programs, into college, and moving forward and on career paths. Those are the things that are going to make a change. Uh, you know, the, 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 the wealth gap that we talk about, uh, that wealth gap is a real number. And, and how do you deal with, and some of, some of the racism that we see out there is because people perceive somebody who's hanging on the corner as, 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 as not being part of the society, and, and there's, there's an assumption made there. We have to change that. That's what this is all about. That's what these conversations really have to lead us to. And, and I think that it's important. And I appreciate the woman down the back who talked about why aren't these dialogues in Roxbury, in Mattapan, and Dorchester. I mean, they will be in Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. But, but when, when Will Morales, who told me the story about his son and the dashboard and the, and, and the license, I didn't even think of that. I didn't think of the fact when I, if I got pulled over that my first thought was to put my license on the dashboard, hands on the wheel. I never thought of that. And a lot of people aren't thinking of that. So that's, those are the conversations that we have to have, what pe how people feel. Gentlemen, back Thank there. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Thank you for coming. And um, we certainly applaud the Glo Boston Globe in doing the series on race. 
you don't have to tell us about, um, about racism in the African American community. We understand all the, its ugly tentacles and how it affects every aspect in our life. You talk about the edginess. Well, the edginess is going to come because it's a visceral experience. Amen? There are biases and prejudices that we all have. And that's got to be broken down so that we can talk one another. You see, this income inequality leads to this social segregation. And back in the day when blue-collar families and white-collar families lived together, they saw each other in the hardware store. They saw each other sitting down in the pews. So how can you empathize with people that are dealing with violence and, and, and mental illness and all the different atrocities that we face in the African-American community how can you empathize when you're apart from that? So in regards to the income thing, I just wanted to say was in regards to the seaport, there were billions of dollars poured into the seaport area as far as building and whatever. How did the African-American community prosper from that? Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for what you said because of um, you, hit it, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. Um, as, far, as, far, as far as some of the points we want to make here today. Um, the seaport's a whole different situation. I mean, I'm not, a lot of the development, all the, most of the development down there is private. Uh, and, and there was no real effort made to make sure that part of the development team, um, there were developers of color. Um, there was money made down there in the construction site, but there was no money made in the development itself. And I think that you know, what we've tried to do in the city, and the state, quite honestly, did it over in, at Massport with the new hotel um, that they're putting forward, the Army Hotel. There's part of that development team uh, is a person of color. There's actually three or four people of color, part of the different development teams on the waterfront now on the city, on the state side. At the Omni Hotel. On the Omni Hotel. We're looking as well on the city side where, where we have land that we own to do it. But when you're but trying... Can, can you you can you, you can't uh, exert that kind of influence on a private developer who's putting up, uh, uh, you know, other no, than we can ask. a partnership for uh, low-income housing, we, other we, than that, can we, you say, uh, you know what, you're going to put up this fabulous, you're going to get some kind of tax break, can't you have some diversity in the people planning, the, the designing, you know, from the mailroom to the no, boardroom? Uh, unfortunately, in some ways we can't because you're talking about private development. I mean, we can suggest it. But we can't stop it. What we can do is, is now we, we've changed our Boston Jobs policy so we can force uh, more participation on the construction site. We've changed our numbers to 51% Boston residents, 40% people of color, 12% women. Prior to we changing that, it was tw uh, 50, 25, and 10. So we can push on that level. But what we really have to do is on the larger scale to get more developers of color into Boston. And there's some here. We need to get them more engaged in some of these developments to build, build equity. And ultimately to let them recognize that there is talent and developing the talent so they, have, no, they don't have the excuse anymore, uh, we can't find There's talent. no question that there's talent here. There's no question, and there's no question that, that we, we do have the developers that are out there that can partner with some of these mega developers to be part of it, to build wealth, so they can be part of deals themselves down the road. How about the gentleman uh, in the white hat right over there, I think? I felt, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. And I have the mic, too. Okay. Um. There you go. <laughs> it's hard to see up here. The lights are in there. I totally get it. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. I'm Claire Barker from Jamaica Plain. This is a question about policing equity. Um, we all are proud to be a sanctuary city based on the thought that you need to have a dialogue between immigrants and the police. You don't want a hostile relationship. But we also know from the ACLU, and I'm sure every person of color in this room knows about the over-policing in minority neighborhoods. So. I also, we also know that the commissioner is having dialogues in communities, the firefighters are having dialogues, but when are we going to get past that to really equal policing? And what's the role of body cameras and a civilian review board to get us there? Okay, well, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty loaded question you just gave me, so let me try and decipher it. I think that we've gone beyond the, beyond the conversations now. Uh, in the policing community, and we continue to have the dialogues. I think you always have to have di dialogues with the police. Uh, you can never stop that because it's always, the, the relationship's always changing, just like the police job is always changing. Uh, you know, f 40 years ago, they, they were chasing bad guys and arresting people, and, and today it's, it's gone completely different. Uh, so I think that that's important. I think the dialogue uh, with, with the immigrant community, uh, our police commission has been very clear that he it does never intends to do ICE's job for them in going out and, and, and bringing people in uh, that are undocumented in our city and doing what, the, doing what they're supposed to be doing. So we're going to continue to work on that stuff.
out. Uh, we changed the co-op board. Uh, we expanded the co-op board to five members. Uh, this is the, civ the civilian review board that we have in Boston. And we also increased their, their caseload to 20 cases, 20% 20 of all cases. Uh, we've seen a steady decline in, in police, uh, excessive force by police officers over the last, since, since Commissioner Evans has taken over and since I've become the mayor, uh, we've seen that number nearly drop 50%. Uh, and we want to continue to see that number drop 50%. The body camera program, ironically, we're at Northeast University. They're doing the study. We're going to have the first draft of a study coming out in the next, I think, next week or so. And we're going to be looking at that and we're going to make decisions on that. Um, the jury's out around the country on body cameras. Uh, there's been studies, the New York Times did a report uh, a few months ago saying that the body cameras have made very little impact in, in the relationship and in, in, in the crime in, in their city. So we're, going to, we're looking at that, but we're going to make those determinations as we move forward. It's a constant, ex a constant move forward. The last thing, you, you bring up an interesting point with the over-policing in, in communities uh, uh, of color. Um, I think that, I don't hear that that often, and it, there's a mix there. When I talk to older people of color, uh, a lot of times when you talk to them, they want to make sure that there's police presence in their community. Uh, and I don't think there's an over-policing. I would actually not rather have our police do other things than having to be in communities. And I think that that's, I mean, the last thing we want to do is over-police in a particular neighborhood. Because when you do that, uh, other neighborhoods complain about it. Other neighborhoods say, what about us? How come our neighborhoods? I, I live in C11, okay? That's a district. Um, Bowdoin Geneva is in that area, and, and, and Cedar Grove is in that area, and Lowell Mills. Um, the people of Lowell Mills, and, 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 and not people of Lowell Mills, the people of Cedar Grove and Aponte will say, we want more police presence driving around the streets. But oftentimes, we'll see them, we'll have more police walking beats in Bowdoin, Geneva, because people there say, we want more presence there because we want to make sure that people feel safe there. So that, that's, a, that's a tricky answer. I know that, that you brought it up, and I appreciate it. I'd love to have more conversation with you afterwards, because I think that's kind of like a, uh, you know, people talk about around the country. I think it's, I feel like it's different here in Boston. This, this, this lady's been waving her hand from the very beginning, so let me... Thank you very much for personally... Um... Uh, seeing Mayor Walls. Uh, I'm from Philippines. I come here in 1995 and work 1998 to 2009 in the city of Cambridge at the Cambridge Police Payroll and Personal Office. In equality employment opportunity, I'm traumatized at work. I hired a Massachusetts New England super lawyer who graduated here in the Northeastern University and we speak up truth in the Middlesex County Superior Court of Auburn, Massachusetts. And they simply dismiss my discrimina racial discrimina discrimination case. And it's more harming me to death. I'm sorry, and I'm just, uh, you, know, you know what I'm gonna do? If you don't mind, there's a gentleman over here, Jerome Smith, we're going to help you with, with was it in Cambridge you said? Police. This, why, don't, why don't you uh, have <laughs> Dr. Martin help you out here? I have, I have. Listen here. Uh, uh, Hi. May, Mayor Walsh. <laughs> Good afternoon. Go Can I just, um, as, as, as we're dealing, uh, anyone in this room who feels discriminate against, unsafe, if you're an immigrant or non-immigrant. I would just ask the people that work, uh, a couple people that are department heads of the city of Boston, the department heads, if you could raise your hand. I know, like Alejandro's here, Commissioner Evans, uh, David Leonard. If anyone feels, please reach out to these folks today and we, we will help you with, with what, if you have an immigrant issue, our Office of New, uh, Immigrant Advancement is working to make sure that people uh, know their rights here in this, in this, in this city. Uh, so Alejandro's here. So if you have a particular question or concern and you, you don't know who to talk to, just grab one of the folks that work for the city here today, okay? Just a side note. Okay. That's real life right there, folks. Yeah. Would I, would I, okay. Hello, so my name is Brianna, and thank you so much for being here today. And my question really revolves around people like myself. So I was born and raised in Dorchester. I still live in Dorchester, and I'm a proud graduate of BPS. Um, I went to school, you know, through BPS all the way up till 12th grade with black and brown kids. So that's who I was always around until I graduated. And now I work for a university here in Boston, which was the first time I ever encountered severe blatant racism for the first time in my life. And I'm really curious to know 
Instead of feeling like I have to leave the city of Boston because I'm not welcomed here, someone who was born and raised here and should feel supported, I'm curious to know in which way the city of Boston and people like yourself, Mayor Walsh, are able to support people like myself who are graduating from college yeah. and working full time in this city. And regardless of the fact that I'm not working for the city of Boston and maybe a private institution, how are you able to support people like myself? Thank you. May, may I ask you, how is it that you felt you know, after graduating through the high schools and everything, and you, they, you now don't feel welcome. Oh, it's it's a terrible feeling because for no, but how is it? You know, is it specific incidents? People saying things. Oh yes, of course, okay. of course. You know, and feeling like I don't belong in a city in which I I was raised. Okay, yes. thank you. My answer to you is, I want to work with you, and you help me, and you help me explain it out to people. What I mean by that is be more engaged in the conversation. Explain to me the situations that are happening. Explain to me, and how do we use our office, how do we use City Hall, 18,000 employees, to be able to, to go out in the community and what people are experiencing in City Hall, make sure they get to experience that in the private sector as well. How do we keep young black talent and young people of color's talent in the city of Boston and don't lose them? Some, some of, when you look at the numbers of, of the different companies and what's happening is, is that people are losing talent. Now we're making, when I say we, the city of Boston is making a concerted effort to keep young talents and talents here in the city, on the city side. We are losing that, we're losing young people to other cities. I hear New York and Chicago and Atlanta all day long, people talk about going because it's more friendly or more open. We, we gotta change that, 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 with that dynamic. And we gotta change that reality to make people wanna stay here. So my answer to you is how do you do that? You get involved. And you get involved with, not, not politically get involved, get involved with a group. We have Spark Boston that we talk about how do we reach out to millennials. Maybe we start a group of young people of color professionals out of the city, City Hall, not, not connected to the City Hall per se, but how do we reach out in the community? You have Megan Costello here from Women's Advancement who reach out constantly to how do, we, how do we train women to negotiate better salaries and higher salaries for themselves because what happens is they leave, they leave town because other places are more open to pay more. So there's a lot you can do. So before you leave here today, I want you just to, somebody's going to get you before you leave and your friends and, and just be engaged and explain to me what it is we need to do. Good afternoon. Because that's never happened before. No, I don't think anybody elected official stood on, stood on the stage and said, well, I want you to explain to me what I can do better. Again, it's about learning, because I learn every day, so how do, you, how do I do it to do it better? Good afternoon. Let, let me, let's go to, he's got, the, yeah. he's got the mic, he's got the mic. I, got, on the I have the mic. I, I'm right, two, come back to the mic. This young man right here, he's been here One, for a little bit. One, two, all right? Let me do this young man. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, my name is Tayden Rose. I'm from Crossroads Leadership Camp, and there was a racial incident at a Red Sox game, and I believe something else happened on Saturday Night Live. And I just have, want to know what kind of effect did that have on you in the image of Boston? Oh, it hurts. I mean, uh, you know, you had a, at the Red Sox game, obviously the Adam Jones situation, but you had, the next day you had a situation with a, with a, with a father and, and his son uh, and, and somebody singing the national anthem. Uh, later in the season you had, um, you had some, a couple of guys throwing a, 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 a sheet or, uh, talking about racism in, in Boston or, over Fenway Park. Uh, you had Michael Che, who, who uh, made the comments on Saturday Night Live, which was hurt, hurtful to the city and hurtful. I mean, I'm like, we got to deal with this. I mean, when I say this, I reached out to him a couple times. He came in Boston a few weeks later for a comedy show. We weren't able to hook up. Uh, I'll take you back. One of my favorite actors of all time is Denzel Washington. Um, and, um, and, and Denzel made, it, made a statement that in the 80s or early 90s, he had a very bad incident in Boston that, that kind of affected him. And I reached out to Denzel during movies. He doesn't meet with anybody, he just focused on movies. So those are the conversations I'd like to find out like exactly what they experience and, and how do we continue to, to change that perception and the reality. It's not perception, it's reality. And I think that that's the important piece here is when, when I hear that stuff, it's sad. It's sad. Um, you know, the, the conversations that we're having on, on race, um, we started these to, ha to actually get to a point uh, in our city that, that I don't know if we can make everyone understand what racism is and race, but get to a point in our city where people can acknowledge this change. Um, the, the, the story that I think what the Globe story missed was that from right before the Civil Rights Movement until let's say the 80s, there was, if you look at the, if you look at data, you could see real, some, not real positive change, but some change in Boston. And, you know, more people were going to college, more people were working in society, more people were going to, doing, going to school, and, and we, had, we, had, we actually had a middle class, a bigger middle class, 
for communities of color than we do today. The story is what happened from the 80s to now, why that growth hasn't happened. Every other area has grown, every other sector has moved up, except for people of color. The numbers of education still similar, the numbers on boards are still similar. So we had so much tremendous gain and momentum, obviously after civil rights, because you had a lot going on then. And then, and then in the 80s, it just kind of, it just stopped. So I think that that's what, when, when, when we talk, when the video, the video you saw today, every single person in that video works for the city. Now, that speech was supposed to be me giving the speech to you this morning. And what I said was, let's do it something different. Because every aspect of our city, we talk about equity, we talk about race, we talk about opportunity, regardless of what we do. And, you know, what we want to do is get some, some of the private sector having that conversation internally to talk about what equity and race is, talk about how do you get young women and men of color who went to college, whether they're from Boston, they went to high school in Boston, they might have went to college somewhere else, or you went to college in Boston. How do we keep you here? How do we keep you? Those are the dialogues that has to happen. And that's the intention of the dialogue. In the dialogue, yeah, people say, oh, you're just going to talk. No, it's not just about talking. It's about understanding what the situation is. And so to your question is, yeah, it hurts. It hurts bad because, because I love this city. And, and I love the people in this city. And I love the diversity of our city. Boston, Massachusetts, in the last four years has grown tremendously. 28% of our residents come from another, another country. 48% of first generation. We have 50, well, over 50% of our residents are people of color. Uh, and and I, you know, I think 18% black and 20% Latino and Asian. So we have a, such a diverse city. And you hear Washington news coming out, how bad the immigrants are and how bad this is going on. We have a pretty good city going on for, for all the challenge in the United States of America. So I think we have a lot more work to do, but it does hurt. It hurts bad. Mr. Mary, I got the queue over here. Yeah, I have hello. a little time left. Uh, lady in the back. Yes. Yes, hello. My name is Cassie Quinlan, and um, I, I'm a, I was a lost Canadian who ended up driving a school bus and busing desegregation in Boston from 76 through 80, mid-80s. Um, I saw what happened. Uh, I saw the gains that were made that were then thrown out by the interpretation that the whole thing was a failure. Uh, media matters. Media matters what it says. Um, here's my question, which I, you know, to me, Boston has trouble partly because it's very hard to make Boston a village. It's gigantic and so, you know, Hyde Park is so far away from Charlestown, so far, all the towns are very far apart from each other. And what we keep doing, and there's wonderful efforts being made, I'm very excited to see in black communities, white communities, everything happening, and the mayor, everybody working hard. At the same time, it's all through an institutional focus and bringing back black people to white neighborhoods to have conversations. To me, what I would like to see is something that happens, and I just thought of this today, but I don't know, people watch sports. How about more informal sports competitions between all the neighborhoods in Boston, televised? Um, and your you know, question is? That's it. Can we possibly can, can I just... away from, you know, add something to be in, in, in communities of color without, because that's what I did. After my school bus, I've been in black communities. I don't see enough white people who are there. And how do we encourage that without being there to be the police? I, I think, can I just jump in? Service. You, Informal. You mentioned, you mentioned having uh, black people come to white communities for conversation. I'm not sure exactly what that means, because we haven't done that here. Um, and, and I think, again, as I said earlier in the conversation, uh, it's about having people understanding, uh, getting to the understanding of what race and racism is. I think if you ask, I think if you did a, a, a poll, in Massachusetts or Boston, does anyone understand what racism is and means? People would say, yes, I do. I if you ask them to explain it, can't. they couldn't. So, so this dialogue, these, these conversations and what we're doing is about understanding what, what it is, not just a word and the meaning of a word, but how it affects the people that live in our city. Got it. I just want to wrap up with one quick Wait, sentence. Hold on. Let's, let's give other people one, a chance. We need, we need a question. A question. We need a question. Give me a question. I have, I have somebody over here with a question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt. I'm sorry. Uh, one person over here. Uh, I know I'm being a little bit abrupt, but Thank we only have about five minutes left. Thank it's you very him much. being abrupt, not me. Uh, all right. <laughs> it's me, not the mayor. You can blame me. And thank you very much, uh, Mayor uh, Marty Warsfall, that you've done with bicycling. Uh, I think it's a social issue too, 
uh, because many people don't have a car and you use bicycling as a mode of transport. I'm going to take you on the road with so, me, right? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. I pre, you know, in, uh, there is more to be done. My question is re in regards to uh, the Globe mentioned one of the places that I work for. Now I work here at, at Northeastern as a faculty member. I worked at Dana Farber Cancer Institute for eight years, and you talked about places where the leadership is all white um, and in the private sector, and they are considered tax exempt. Uh, and what I saw in my eight years in the human resources department there were many, many uh, uh, people who had been worked there, people who were color uh, for nine, ten years, specifically uh, single moms of color, that they could not move up because they didn't have a bachelor's degree when we are surrounded by institutions such as Northeastern, uh, uh, Simmons, uh, all these colleges around the hospital like Dana Farber, uh, what can we do to make these institutions bring opportunities to these moms mm -hmm. uh, of color who need to complete their studies so that they yep. can move up? And, and it takes a guy to ask the right question, th right? Th thank you for the question. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to just single out one employer. I mean, the Globe singled themselves out in the paper, so they have an, they have an opportunity as well to help people, uh, you know, advance in their careers over there. I think that about three, two years ago, I had a conversation at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, it was all the business leaders in Boston, and two-thirds of my speech was on, on, on race and opportunity. And what happened off, off of that conversation was that the, Jimmy Rooney, who's the head of the chamber, um, brought a, a group of, a subcommittee of, of, of leaders to talk about um, how do they advance people within corporations as far as pro, uh, projections into leadership, but also look at the corporate boards and look at, look at the policies and things like that. So that dialogue is happening. I mean, it happened long before this series of last week. So I think that we have to, I think the fact that you have to acknowledge the problem. I think a lot of these institutions and, and, and workplaces, including the city and the state, need to acknowledge the problem. And if you acknowledge the problem, then you can deal with the problem. And I think that that is part of any type of recovery. And I think racism, if anyone who's in recovery in the room, racism, I, I can equate it to you understand you have an issue and you have to deal with the issue, address the issue. And while you're addressing the issue, you address the issue currently in front of you, but you also have to deal with the past because the wreckage of the past has damages for the future. And that's really what we have to think about. How do we do that? Mr. Mayor, I'm told uh, our time is up. Let's take a couple more questions. One, one more, right over here, this young lady. Hi, I'm Isaiah. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Yes, you. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, me. Hi, yeah. how are you? You next. No, no. This lady here, and then come back to you. Yes. I just want to say thank you for having this because it's really important. It's crucial, really, for us all to be talking about this issue. Um, I think what I haven't heard is that racism is at four different levels. It's at the value level, institutional level, where you can make the biggest impact, interpersonal, which I keep hearing people talking about the interpersonal, and this internal, where people internalize their racism. I would just like to know how will these conversations continue? How will you facilitate them yes. to the city of Boston? Facilitate them? I, I hear you saying that we go back into our communities, but actually facilitate them. Yeah, that's going to be explained the next step after this, after this conversation. So we're going to, I'll take one more question, then the, as we break into sessions, that's right going to be all explained to everyone. Uh, I'm Isaiah. I'm from Tina. So don't leave before that's explained to you, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Isaiah, sorry, Isaiah. All right. So um, my question to you is that I understand that this is supposed to be a dialogue and everything, but our communities are at risk right now. We have developers that keep making these buildings that don't put in the rent, the market rent, actual properties within the building. They're not even handicap accessible. They keep building restaurants in my neighborhoods, and I'm scared that in the next 10 or 5 years, I'm not going to live in Boston anymore. Yeah, where do you live? What neighborhood? I live in Dorchester right now. Can I just address that? Um, th what we're talking about today is, is the conversation on race. On, on, uh, what, you, what you brought up was equity across the city and housing and a whole bunch of issues. And we're constantly working on those issues. Um, in the video that was, was, that was seen before this, everybody that spoke uh, works in different departments across the city of Boston. Equity is at the core of it. So, for example, when we talk about housing and creating more housing, uh, we're looking at gentrification and how do, we, how do we build more housing product to make sure that, that people can live in their neighbors. I'm a Dorchester kid, too. I live in Dorchester. Um, economic development, how can we bring jobs to communities that 
can give middle class jobs for folks in, regardless of the education level, regardless of, of what's going on, regardless of backgrounds and quarries and all that stuff. So we'll work, we work on all those different aspects. And I just ask you, you know, you can, you can access it by either going on uh, our website or you can have conversations here today with some of our folks, but we're not, we're not holding back on any of that stuff. Um, sitting right in front of you is gonna be our new director of Health and Human Services, Manny Martinez and his departments that fall under him are probably the most impacted equity departments in the city. So we're constantly out in the communities working on stuff. When um, Danielson Tavares and Tanya talked about hiring in the city of Boston, in the last four years, 54% of all hires that we brought on in the city, 54% are people of color at all different levels. So my cabinet, we have people of color in my cabinet. We have, so it's important as we think about this and as we think about getting somebody on the ground floor, for, per se, how do you help them um, move, advance through the organization so they get into a position they can be successful? That's, those are all things. Mr. Mayor, do you, do you foresee, and I think at the point of the question here is that the city is being priced out for working folks, regardless of color, but in particular, the communities of color. Uh, yeah. You know, so as the development goes out into the communities, guess what? All of a sudden, these, you know, nice apartments that the folks who couldn't afford the seaport, they're now affording it a little further out, and it's bumping Let the Let me tell you this. We've, we've permitted, in the last four years, we've permitted 22,000 units of housing. What does that mean? That means we've, we've built and in, in, we're in the process of building more housing than any other period, probably. That, that maybe, maybe in the early days of the Boston, they built that, many, that much housing. But we, in the... In, in the probably most of the 20th century in the 21st, clearly, we've built more moderate low-income housing than, than almost any other period ever, and we're building more housing. So we have 22,000 units of housing. Our population, yes we have, our population has grown by 30,000 people. So as we're building housing, people are moving into the city of Boston. So it's like, so we, we have to try to keep up with the, the productivity, and, and we're also faced with, in some cases, um, we're hitting walls in neighborhoods because like, we don't need more housing. So it's kind of like, we, we, at some point, we have to, do we shut the door and say, we're not going to build any more housing, we're full? Or, or what happens there? We have set a record for building low-income housing, and we have set a record for building affordable it's housing. And, yes, it is. And we have also, we've changed the inclusionary development policy from 13% to 18%. With the help of the voters of Boston, we passed the Community Preservation Act to raise money for housing and economic development. So that has to be acknowledged. You don't, you don't have to acknowledge it, but if you look at the numbers and you see what we've done, Sheila Dillon's right here, she'll explain it to you. And if you're in, involved in housing, you know it's true. Okay. Hello? <laughs> Last question? Last question. Mr. Hyde. Hi, my name's Beth. Um, I'm sorry, no, right up in front here, last question. She's been asked. Last question, right here. Um, I work in the private sector, and I notice that you mention a lot of initiatives for equality in the city of Boston. Is there any way to put requirements for businesses that they, because as we see at the national level, the private sector is going to get a huge tax break, possibly. Aren't we doing enough for the private sector for the private sector businesses? Can't they give something back to the community? To yeah, no, I, I um... the people of the United States. And is it possible at a citywide level to put some requirements in place for we... hiring, et cetera, et cetera? On the construction side, we can As do on the construction side we can do that. Uh, it's been challenged in a couple cities in, in Massachusetts, and one where the, the, the policy got thrown out. So we're, we're kind of um, we're walking a fine line there. Um, we talk, have those conversations all the time, um, and we're going to continue to have those conversations. I think some companies have done better than others. Um, I think some companies need to do more, and they haven't. Uh, and I think that, you know, again, it goes back to these conversations about having these conversations inside businesses. Let me just try and make one analogy, and then I'll stop, because I know we have to do breakout sessions. Four years ago, we acknowledged in Boston that we didn't acknowledge, we knew. They've been talking about it for 100 years, the pay equity between men and women. And we started uh, what's called salary negotiation workshops. And our goal was in five years to have 85,000 conversations around the city of Boston. And to this point, we've had 6,000 conversations of the city of Boston. And how many of those were successful, roughly? 90% of 6,000 people have gone through our salary negotiation workshop and have been able, women, all women, have been able to go and negotiate a higher salary. Now, the reason why I say that to you 
is because it started off as a conversation. It became a policy. It became a working group. And these, 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 these say, 5,500 women have gone into the business world and negotiated higher pay for themselves because of something that started in the city. These race dialogues can do the same exact thing, to your point, to have these conversations, to bring these conversations into the workplace, to have these dialogues about how do we change the cultures of giving people opportunities for moving forward. That's what these conversations are all about. It's not about changing the city hall. It's not about changing city departments, although we'll do that. It's about taking these conversations, these dialogues, to other areas. That's what this is all about. And when people say, well, these dialogues are just conversation, a conversation can change, one conversation can change the world. And I mean that. When somebody explains what it feels like to be walking around a store shopping and having security walk you around, if they don't understand what that's all about, can change the way people, the perspective and the understanding of people's understanding towards each other. And that's what these conversations are all about. Is it going to be the answer? I don't know. But it's going to, be, it's going to make a bit more understanding society of people knowing what's going on. That's what this is all about. I want you to leave, leave here today and don't leave here and say, oh, this is all nonsense and nothing's going to happen. You know something? Take that and, and, and focus on having a dialogue, having a conversation. Explain it to somebody who doesn't understand what we're talking about in the city. Take that somewhere else tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. For Thank you, Mr. Today. Mayor. And just in case you didn't get it, conversations beget ideas. Ideas can lead to policy. Policy can lead to action, and action can lead to change. Let's all take that with us as we continue with the rest of our day. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here. Hold on before you start moving. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you are not staying for a session, please try to keep your voices down because other folks who are staying need to hear the instructions for the next part. I appreciate your cooperation and support. And as we transition, before I get into these weeds and details, I just want to remind us of something that uh, the wonderful Paulo Freire has said around the power of dialogue. Again, I want to ask folks who are leaving to keep your voices down so that the rest of us can make sure that we hear what's happening and can transition to our breakout sessions. I appreciate your support in that. So as we think about the power of dialogue, it's not for the words themselves. They are a form of action because if we cannot be in the same conversation, if we do not have the same language, understanding of the issues, we'll be continuing to do what we've been doing over the last generations, which is talking at each other, but not really being in dialogue with each other. We can't get to action if we're not on the same page about the reality of our society and how it impacts all of us. That's, in essence, in terms of what the mayor was talking about, where we're trying to go with this, right? So that we can be on the same page, because when we don't have the sophisticated understanding that respects the complexity of what racism is, how it works, and how it impacts all of us, then we can't get to the appropriate approaches that will help us actually address the issues because we don't fully understand them collectively. So that's where we're trying to go with this. And I want to make sure that we, as we transition to our sessions, that I leverage some of my humility and admit that I made a mistake earlier, so I want to call that out. So I forgot to mention housing. So Boston tackles home ownership, housing discrimination, and displacement. So for those folks who are here to learn more about what the city's doing around housing, there's an amazing panel um, that will be focusing on those issues. So, the, so as we transition, we're going to do this in groups. So hopefully you decided on which session you want to participate in. Yes? Awesome, thank you. So dialogue to action. Again, these are the facilitators who have recently been trained on how to 
collectively be on the same page around a framework on how we move forward with these discussions. They were just, fin they just finished their training yesterday, actually. And I see some of those beautiful faces right here in the fourth row. They are going to um, Richard's 200. Where the vo where's the volunteer who's taking folks to Richard's 200? Perfect. Can you come up here, please? Where, oh, not all the way to the front, but just where folks can see you. So for our facilitators, this gentleman right here waving his arms behind you, our facilitators in the fourth row. That gentleman right there, our facilitators in the fourth row. That gentleman right there in the white shirt with the black jacket on, raise your hands again, with the phone in his hand, he's going to take you back to that session. So that's both for the facilitators and that's for the participants who want to talk to the facilitators about their experience and how we move forward. So if you want to go to that session, that's the gentleman that you're going to go with. He has his hands up. Thank you, my dear. I appreciate you. Dialogues to action. If that's the group you want to go to, the gentleman is walking out towards the exit right now. And you're going to Richard's 200 just in case you get separated from the group. Richard's 200. Where's the volunteer for Boston's immigrant community? There we go. See this wonderful gentleman right here who's always stylish and dapper? He has his hand up with the paper. If you want to go to Boston's immigrant community, that's...